Good afternoon. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Nice Apple's Young Professionals Committee discussion on how to be a successful news surveyor. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple items to make sure you all understand how the discussion will work. Similar to our webinar process, on the screen you'll see it, we have a screenshot of what the dashboard looks like. Doing a quick sound check, using the raise your hand button, if you can hear me, please raise your hand. While we wait for hands to go up, I'd like to remind you that we cannot hear you. So if you have a question, please use the question box on your dashboard and send it in at any time. You can send in comments and questions and the committee will address them as needed. Okay, so now I see that most of your hands are up. So I'm gonna turn everything over to our committee chair, Tim Bassey. Hi, Tim. Thank you, Heather. And, uh, and welcome everyone, welcome to our second session of the Young Professionals, Young Professionals Committee um, webinar uh, series. Uh, today's discussion is how to be a successful new surveyor. Um, I see we have some folks on the line. Some folks on the line look like new surveyors, some folks on the line look like experienced surveyors to me from what I know. Um, but hopefully today will be a, a real nice opportunity to have a conversation about what are folks looking for? What are people hiring? Why are they getting hired? Um, who are the people who are advancing in their careers? And what, what attributes do they have um, that you can start to emulate as well? Um, <clears throat> on the line, I'm just gonna, we're gonna do a couple quick introductions. My name is Timothy Massey. I am the land surveyor for National Grid uh, down on Long Island. I also chair the Young Professionals Committee. Um, been doing this now for three years, and one of the things that that I want to stress to to each and every one of you on the line is that the, this committee is is here for you um, to understand what the the wants and needs are, um, and develop the folks, develop and recruit into the profession to really help people um, achieve the same uh, quality of life that I think you know each one of us uh, has because of that. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Mike Lewis to do a quick introduction for himself as well, and then uh, Jay Graff will, will jump on and we'll we'll get started. Hi everybody, my name is Mike. I work for GDB Geospatial on Long Island. Uh, I've been a land surveyor for going on 23 years now. I've been licensed since 2012, um, and when it came time to putting together this webinar, I thought back to my first survey job, which was basically knowing nothing about the profession and having a relative who was a builder get me a job with a land surveyor that needed an extra field crew a couple of days a week um, and i learned the profession as i go so i I'm, i've been an apprentice basically my whole life um, and i think you're going to get a lot out of this one as far as helping you not make some of the mistakes maybe i made a great way to say it mike jay up to you bub Hi, I'm uh, Jay Graff. I'm, I'm the Vice President at uh, GDB Geospatial. Um, we're a 65-plus person geospatial-focused land surveying firm covering uh, all of New York State out of two offices in Rochester and Long Island. Uh, I've been involved in um, Nice Apples and our Nassau Suffolk Regional most of my career. Um, I've served on the board of the uh, Nassau Suffolk Civil Engineers. Um, I've been on the YP committee since its inception, and I'm the chairperson of the legislative committee. Um, I do a lot of hiring in my office, and I, I think we've gained some insight. Um, I, I came up as an experience-based only land surveyor to get my license. So I, I started working 20 plus years ago with knowing almost nothing about this profession. And um, I think we're gonna talk today about how you can come into some a profession maybe you have a little bit of passion about and um and succeed as as a younger or new employee leaving the world of academics and entering the world of uh of commercial or municipal land surveying that's an excellent excellent lead in jay and um <clears throat> and i want to encourage um the folks who are on the line uh the folks who are listening the folks who are attending there's not a whole lot of us and we're here, we're a small group, you see us, it's three of us. If you guys have questions or you have anything that you wanna talk about, shoot them down in the chat and let's talk about them. That's what we're here for. So if anything anything uh, rings your bell, 
um, please let us know and we'll, we'll dive into it. But Jay, speaking about some of the hiring that you do, um, you know, there's obviously, we're all, I won't say we're all, but you know, a lot of businesses are booming right now, but what kind of advice or what are you looking for, for from a graduate coming in? Maybe somebody who, who is coming out of one of the schools. What would your, what are you looking for that might be different than an experienced um, employee? Question one, I'm already muted. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, when, when we're hiring a younger person, especially someone who's come out of a, a two or a four year surveying program, uh, first of all, doesn't happen very often downstate, um, you know, where our headquarters is. It happens much more often upstate where we're near uh, Ranger School or uh, SUNY Alfred. So these, these candidates have one box checked already, and that's they have a gist of this profession, and they've just demonstrated in the past two or four years that they're committed to it. That's not a major commitment, but you know, when someone decides they want to attend an academic institution, institution, pay that money, um, put in all the hard work to get a degree, you know, they're they're checking a box for me already that these people are interested in some career that has to do with land surveying and um, civil engineering, AEC, whatever it may be. That's that's box number one. Now, we don't expect every one of these people to be able to hit the ground running in our office and uh, you know, use the latest technology, impart this major impact right, right away. What, we, what we're hiring on is potential, right? So when, when we, we see a candidate come out of uh, one of these schools, they got good grades, they had an interesting senior project, um, what we're looking for next is, you know, how are they driven or do they fit our company culture? Because a lot of people in our company were hired basically just, do they fit our core values? Do they, do they fit our company culture? Are they going to thrive in our environment? We can teach the rest, but th those graduates have that heads up, that, that leg up, that they've, they've got two to four years experience, maybe a couple internships, and um, we're hiring on potential. How is this candidate going to fit into our organization? We know we're going to have to train them. I don't care if you have a four-year degree in land surveying. Um, you're going to have to be trained. Um, are are these people willing to realize that 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 degree is step zero, and now you're going to get your your re, quote unquote real education um, under our our tutelage? So um, we're looking for personality. We're looking for potential. Oh, that's great. It's a it's a really positive message too because I think that um, especially in land surveying, it, it's something that that not everybody even knows what we do. Um, sometimes you got to kind of you got to place that bet that hey we have a high a high potential person here and they once we kind of get them in the loop and we we hook them with surveying they're gonna they're gonna be a positive employee I think that's a great message. Um, in with respect to that, how does how does a grad have someone coming out of a graduating class as a surveyor stand out? Um, you know, sometimes there's, you know, right now might not be the case, but a year from now or a year ago, it might have been a little more challenging to uh, to get that job. And I know a lot of folks, especially from our schools in the state, were, were planning on heading out west. Um, what kind of advice would you give uh, a graduate who wants to stand out um, with the group now and also maybe stay local? Well, I, I would tell the graduates from upstate not to be afraid of moving to New York City. Uh, there, there's there's so much interesting survey work downstate. Um, some of it happens in the most congested parts of the world, um, but you know, 30, 40 minutes outside of the city, you, you have suburbia. Um, 60 minutes, you have more rural environments. Um, so we're we're always trying to to lure the people from. Uh, you know, Monroe County, who just got their four-year degree at Alfred, like, please move downstate. We like it down here. It's really nice, I promise. Um, so that that's what I'd be telling them. Don't 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 be afraid to uh, spread your wings a little bit. 
that's great. But but as far as uh, you know, them getting getting a leg up, um, I think when 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 it gets competitive, and it's it's a employer's market instead of employees' market, you can't just hit that button on uh, whether it's Indeed or one of these other uh, job search sites to, you know, one click apply and your resume just gets sent out to the world. Uh, you've you've got to do something to stand out a little better. Um, I don't be afraid of writing a cover letter, but if you write it, it's got to be good. It's got to be personalized. Um, go to our website, follow our social media, ask a specific question, say, hey, I saw you did this. Here's how that, here's how something I did in college sounds like it correlates very well. Um, with uh, LinkedIn being very popular, there's always the ability for someone to make a connection with someone else in the company ask about the company, you know, develop some sort of relationship lower on the totem pole. You, you know, I'm not going to accept LinkedIn connections from, you know, every random person who asks for them, but um, hey, if it comes with a message that says, I'm graduating from the school, I'm interested, help me out. Oh, please, you're, we're going to be speaking. That's, that's what we do here as part of the stewardship of our profession. So the advice is, don't just hit the apply button and uh, you know go to the beach and wait for the answers. Um, make yourself stand out. There's plenty of interest in uh, graduating uh, survey students and even people who chose chose not to go the uh, educational route. Just stick your nose in there and see what happens. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a great um, a great message for the folks on the line. Um, some of us didn't get into surveying by choice. Some of us got into surveying um, by tripping into it. And I think for the, at least for the folks who are here on the line who are active within the association, you know, we may have tripped into it, but we fell in love with it. Um, and, but it's a great message for us to push out into the world that, hey, listen, you want a, a lucrative career as a surveyor, you can have that and you can build it. Um, and it didn't have to start with doing that four-year degree. Um, Mike, I know you have a big history with training and training from, you know, the more advanced stuff that, that comes in through the office, but you also have uh, a hand in training some of the, uh, the newer folks. What are some of the things or some of the recommendations that you could give somebody on their first day of surveying, maybe not the first day, but some of the things to be prepared for, to know what they're walking into. Well, you've got the, you've got the two different avenues, right? You've got the, the employee who came to the company from formal education. They've probably spent some time in the field. Uh, they've probably spent some time in the office. So they're going to be aware of the, the little nuances of surveying. You're gonna be working in the heat, you're gonna be working in the cold, you're gonna be dealing with ticks, mosquitoes, poison ivy, angry neighbors, the whole nine yards that comes with all that. For the for the ones that maybe didn't expect that part of the profession, oh, I'm working outside. Well, yes, this is what you're gonna be dealing with. You're gonna be dealing with all of those in the above. From the first couple of days out, and when you're coming in completely green, ask a lot of questions. Pay attention, observe, you know, sometimes, uh, your question will be answered for you by just observing how the field party operates. Um, I came into it, you know, again, I, I had a, a relative kind of, yeah, you know, thought I was a math major to begin with, but um, my first day of surveying, I, I picked it up rather well. I felt good about myself the first week, and by week two, I, I thought, not that I knew it all, but I realized, wow, there's, there's a mountain of knowledge to know here, uh, and I'm coming into it as a rod man or an instrument man. Um, so when I when I train somebody new who knows absolutely nothing, I try I try to 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 teach kind of like as a hands-on, and not just you know you need to be able to enter these codes into a data collector. You need this is what a monument looks like. You need to dig to find it. You need to kind of teach them. And, 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 and show them this is why I'm doing it. And for the, for the new employee, it's the same thing. 
well, why am I doing this? You know, why do I need to map this road a certain way? Down here, we're doing a lot of design survey work for engineers that are trying to still to this day figure out how to protect flood prone areas from future storm damage, how to repair our roads and our infrastructure. There's a reason why we map roads a certain way because the engineer needs data collected a certain way. So it's not enough for the new guy to just, oh, he's telling me to do this, so I have to set up the tripod here, or I have to, you know, uh, take a measurement there. Ask those questions. Like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And I tried, did that just two days ago with somebody, brought them out and showed them, this is why we're mapping it this way. This is why you need to take the shots in such a way. You, you spend an extra minute and a half in the field, and that translates to, 15 minutes that we potentially can save in the office. You do that a handful of times. Wow, I just saved a cat operator an hour's worth of time. And it took you three minutes in the field to take a couple extra shots and do it a certain different way. Um, and, and those are the kind of things that I try to impart on a new a new employee. Um, you know, take taking the time to uh, to ask them, do you have any questions? Am I confusing you? You know, if you're confused, ask the question, raise your hand type of thing mentality. Um, that, that's basically, you know, I would say for your first week into the first month, into your first six months to your first year. Um, like we said in the beginning, you, you know what you know, but you don't know what you don't know. So be prepared to, to learn on the fly and learn hands on if that's what it takes. And I think those are great points, Mike. And and some of the best advice that I could give is just pay attention, pay attention to everything. Um, there's a reason in almost everything we do in surveying, there's a reason why it's being done a particular way. If after the third time you've staked out uh, a property and you've noticed that your party chief ties all of the flagging in the same direction, why do they do that? Ask that question. You'll find out. Um, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that can be thought of just by paying attention. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that happen during the course of the day that um, you may not even know you do as the uh, as the person teaching. And uh, you know, there are things that you can help with just by going about your business. <clears throat> so, Jay, speaking to that, on-the-job training, being successful, understanding when to ask questions, when not to ask questions, how do you recommend that an employee start to show um, their interest? You know, obviously, we always talk about showing and not telling. Um, letting people know that you're interested in moving up or you're interested in taking on other challenges or taking on another role or being interested in a different type of surveying. How, for someone who can, has some people come to them to approach them with those questions, how do you like to be approached that way? You know, if, if, you're, if you're working for the right employer, there's almost no wrong way to show ambition. Um, first, when when we when we have a new field tech and they they get assigned a party chief or even even an entire survey party to tag along with, uh, you know, rule number one is leave your cell phone in your pocket, be the first person out of the van. Be asking what you can do next if the crew is not, you know, readily telling you each and every step of the way. Move quickly, move safely, but if, and efficiently. Um, the number one feedback we want to get from the party chief is this person looks like they want to be here. They they have some interest in being here, and this is not what my dad would call a job. This is a this is a this is a career. This is not a job. And you have to hustle and make it known to your uh, colleagues that you want to be there. That's that's right off the bat. 
w- once you get comfortable doing that and you want to start branching off into other things, um, you know, we're sitting here on a nice apples webinar. There, there's nothing preventing that employee from doing professional development. And some of that's going to be provided by your company, hopefully, but there, there's also some stuff that I would recommend they do on their own. Um, if you know your firm does field to finish in Carlson, um, you, you should be on the Carlson website at night, uh, reading their technical articles, uh, follow their social media, find out what's coming up next. Just if you want to be part of this profession, the opportunities are there. Um, and not all of it is going to be spoon fed to you. That would be my number one piece of advice. Uh, I have a, a story. Uh, Greg De Bruin bought a new piece of equipment. I don't even remember what it was. Maybe it was a Leica scan station, like the one of the original laser scanner we had. And we had the thing for about four days. And he asked, who's read the manual? And <laughs> everyone's just looking at him like he's crazy. What do you mean read the manual? And he's like, am I the only one who's read the manual? Uh, it it took it would take almost no effort to raise your hand and say, yeah, I read the manual. So uh, I would my my advice would be to just continue your education uh, through your employer, let them provide you opportunities, but but don't be afraid to continue your education on your own. There's there's so much opportunity from the hardware and the software manufacturers providing YouTube videos and uh, white papers technical articles, you can get a wealth of knowledge from these people. And it's it doesn't all have to come from your uh, supervisor. There, there's stuff you can do on your own to make sure you're keeping up with everybody. Or, or geez, if you do all that, you're going to be getting ahead. That would be my advice for getting ahead, because there's going to be plenty of instrument operators who are there to push buttons and, and not get ahead. So uh, you'll, ex- you'll exceed them by leaps and bounds and the right employers will recognize that and reward you for it. That's great. Mike, do you have uh, you have anything to add on that? Because I'm, I'm sure you you see it as well on your end. Um, I mean, Jay pretty much hit the nail on the head, and I do remember that scan station. I've, I've definitely, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've borne the brunt of, of Greg De Bruin asking this simple question, why didn't you read this first? <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, he really did hit the nail on the head, and it's something that um, I've, you know, again, 23 years, and I'm just starting to realize now that there's there's a wealth of knowledge that I can still apply because I don't see myself retiring from this profession anytime soon. Um, keeping on top of technology in our profession is real. I, I mean, I started out, you know, the the form sheet of writing down horizontal angles and distances and then early on i was introduced to data collectors now we've got we've got the ability to attach laser scanners to drones um you know and staying on top of that technology and changes making that effort to you it, it may it may lead you down a path of you know maybe this company isn't the right fit for me if, if you're really big into technology um, and, and being on the forefront of, of working smarter and harder, but not just harder over smarter, um, it, it may be one of those things where, you know what, this, this company might not be for me. We, we, we seem to be, um, you know, not at the forefront for whatever reason. Some companies, you know, they can't apply that technology. Uh, and that is going to be okay for certain employees. You can work hard and not be at the forefront of technology. But, um, you know, that's something that even just I, I start to try to impress on my son who's only, you know, nine years old. He, he's, I want to be a surveyor. I says, by the time you're ready in nine years, I don't even know if we're going to be using robotic toll stations anymore. Who knows where we'll be going with them? Um, I, I, you know, that's about the only thing I can think of to add is, uh, is never stop learning in anything that you do. Never stop learning. The second you stop learning, the guy next to you, just jump the line, you know, I, I, I'll finish it up with a, you know, I was at a, a Long Island Ducks game and I saw a quote on the wall that was a quote attributed to Derek Jeter. And it basically said that you, you may not be the best at what you do. You may not have the most skills at what you do, but there's no excuse to somebody working harder than you do. Um, and, and hard work 
is not easy. It's something you need to apply to to this profession and any profession that you that you work at. You put in the hard work and you'll reap the results. That's about all I got. That's perfect, Mike. No, and I think you've I think we're 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 all on the same page here. Um, <clears throat> Working hard is really what, what it all comes back to. And the, I suppose the best advice that I could give to whomever is on the phone who is wondering about where is surveying going to take me, when you answer that question, make sure you are answering the question. When you say, what do I want to do with my life? You make the decision. Don't sit back and wait for your employer to make that determination for you. Um, if you want to become an expert in boundary determination, if you want to become the next UAS champion, um, figure out on your off hours how to make that happen. Um, as Jay mentioned earlier, the difference between a career or a job and a profession. Um, a job is going to end at five o'clock. If you want a profession that you can continue to grow and continue to grow your earning potential, frankly, um, it's going to take time. It's going to take time outside of the nine to five to gain that information and gain that edge on the person sitting next to you. And I, and I think that's really a um, something that you will see runs true with not just folks in surveying, but every person that you know in your life that's successful more than likely they're doing something that's more than the person who's sitting next to them. Um, and I think really having that knowledge and knowing that and having the ability to speak to other people to find out what that is, is, is a really, really key element to advancing yourself and, and finding out how you are going to see your future uh, in surveying or elsewhere. <clears throat> um, I would ask anybody who's on, on the line, we're looking for questions. You guys got questions? Let's talk about them. Um, is there anything that you guys are uh, wondering about? We're going to jump into uh, some conversations about mentoring here, uh, which is a, a conversation that the three of us have actually had quite a few times outside of this, uh, this panel. Um, but I look forward to, to hearing some of your, your takes. Uh, hopefully some of you are having lunch and maybe you got a a quick question that doesn't pertain to what we're talking about. Um, you're on the line and listen, we, we want to hear from you. So if you have something, let us know. Um, so Mike, you've been surveying for 20 years. How did you come up? Uh, may, maybe not. The question isn't how did you come up through surveying and be, uh, become involved in it? But, how did you decide or what steps did you take when you realized, hey, this is going to become my profession? Um, you know, was there any, uh, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to mentorship and professional development. Is there anything that kind of triggered you or maybe something you joined or an event you attended where you started to see the benefits of, um, you know, changing from working the nine to five to getting your license and becoming a, a professional surveyor? Um, for me, I had been doing survey, I had been a land surveyor for 13 years at the point where I decided, um, and, and part of it was, you know, I, I had just gotten married, I had just bought a house, and my wife and I had just had a child. So now, okay, you're a land surveyor, you, you need to, you need to take that next step. Um, I had always read the books. I had always asked the questions. I had always tried to learn as much as I could from my previous employer. I, I, I've worked for, you know, the GDB family and one other surveyor for basically my entire life. Um, and I've and I surveyed just about every type of from the smallest little residential to massive army corps projects so i had that background of um of knowledge of, of sort of almost doing every kind of survey out there um and and it was ready to take that next step you know you you've invested your life you've invested 13 years of your life into into a profession and i i 
did kind of look at it as a job. There were definitely times in my life where I looked at it as a job. I can't wait to get to four o'clock and punch out on a Friday. Uh, and I realized that that's not, that's not going to get me anywhere. Um, so I, I filled out my application. I sent it in. I was accepted. And I said, all right, let's get these books and let's start reading. Like I said, I had always kind of read some you know, the introduction to surveying and some of the math. And now I started digging into the principles and practices and, and the different law dictionaries and whatnot. And, and I, I just, I applied myself to take that exam and to pass it because I realized that at the point of my life that I was in, um, you need to take that next step. Otherwise you're just always going to be a party chief. And, you know, I mean, yeah, promotion and, and education hopefully comes with an increase in salary. Uh, and I needed that increase in salary <laughs> if you had a wife and a, and, a, and a child and a house to pay for. Um, and, and, and then it leads to that next path. Well, okay, now I get my license. Am I going to go into business for myself or am I going to continue to work for somebody? If I'm going to continue to work for somebody, who's that somebody going to be? Um, and, and I kind of, I kind of took it from there. I had a number of mentors along the way, um, whether they were positive or negative, um, you know, uh, a person you work with who, who, you know, is, is not always positive. It's hard to work with those people, but it can also, it's a learning experience. You know, you could learn from, you know, somebody who's kind of a little bit more negative than positive. Obviously when you work with somebody who's very positive, you should be learning everything you can off of them. But, um, I, I took all of that into account and I said, you know what, this is a profession that I want to continue on. I want to make this a lifestyle. Um, I want to, I want to see where I can, where I can go with this. And, and I challenged myself to not only, like, I didn't have the scholastic background. I challenged myself. What's like Jay says, step zero was getting that degree. For me, step zero was passing that exam. Um, I, I've never, I've never felt myself to be strong in math. Oddly enough, I'm in a math based profession. I've always struggled with with, uh, you know, the way you brought up in school where you almost have to like memorize the math to take the test and take your book of formulas and apply them. So I, I passed that exam. I, I challenged myself. I met the challenge. Okay. So the next challenge is to get into a company that can, that can, uh, you know, help me grow as a land surveyor and kind of not get pigeonholed into that same, um, you know, we're, oh, we're doing another title survey today. I don't mean to downplay title surveys and things, but I wanted more than that. And I had worked for the De Bruin family, and I saw that I could be going from a marsh in the middle of Jersey doing an Army Corps survey to pounding around downtown Manhattan and everything that comes with that to, like you said, running around the east end of Long Island surveying, you know, acreage simply because a state road runs through the middle of it. Uh, and that was the kind of challenge that I wanted to to uh, to provide for myself or or approach, I guess you could say. And, and I did it. Um, I, you know, I, I took that challenge on. Well, that's great, Mike. And I, and I think there's there's a lot to be said about that. I know um, for for some of the folks, even some of the folks on the on the line know me well. And uh, I just had my my first child 18 months ago, and, and another on the way. And I can tell you that that is a uh, has been a huge motivating factor in my life as well um, into what I want and what I want out of life. Um, Jay, I'm going to get to you on some mentoring questions, but I have a question that I think is perfect for you to answer. Um, Steve on the line was asking, uh, has been out of the industry for 10 years. Can he still get back in as a technician? And if so, what kind of hints? I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but uh, I'll let you take this one. Can you get back into the industry after being out of it for 10 years as a technician? Absolutely. Um, the demand is high right now, you know, especially right now. So if, if we get a cover letter across our desk that says, I used to do this, I took a 10 year break from the industry, here's what I was doing, I wanna get back. I mean, I mean you're, you're in the driver's seat. Um, show the potential show your passion for the industry if if you're a fit for that uh, organization culturally they're going to bring you on um you your pay may be commensurate with your experience 
Um, so even though you've you know, been in the workforce for 10 years plus, we look at you know what what is how does this person fit into our compensation structure based on the work and their, the title we can apply to them and the work they'll be doing. But if if you're willing to get back in, there there's opportunities abound. Um, I, I would also suggest you. Um, I think I said this already. Start following the social media of some of the software and hardware manufacturers. Give yourself a, a sense of where the industry has gone in the past 10 years, technology-wise. 10 years in in our technology is a long time. Um, we weren't flying drones 10 years ago. 10 years before that, they were, we weren't using GPS. So we see these like major changes in technology that I, I think it would behoove a person to, you know, just get up to speed. You know, you, you can't say you have experience doing that laser scanning, but please, please know what a laser scanner is and uh, what what we use them for and what goes into extracting point cloud data out of a point cloud and things like that so just do do your legwork write a nice cover letter and be enthusiastic and i i think you'll have all the luck in the world that's great advice jay and and agreed 10 years within surveying can be a bit um <clears throat> there's they there are uh, educational things right on the nice apples website uh, that you can kind of see how things have been kept up to date. Uh, you can also go back in, read some read some back issues of Empire State Surveyor. I mean, obviously, ten years is a is a big to do to to try to catch up on. But if you can peruse the the main articles over the past the, the past year or so, you, you're really going to be able to pick up on the temperature of uh, the industry right now. 10 years ago, you weren't going to be utilizing quite as much GPS. Um, right now, that's that's probably the core of what a lot of a lot of the folks are out there are out there doing. But um, if you have experience and you're interested in getting back into surveying, uh, my recommendation is don't just take the first job you get offered. Um, get that just like Jay said. Get that letter out. Get a nice letter explaining, you know, hey, you're interested in getting back into the industry. A nice, well-written resume. Um, if there's any issues and you have questions, you can contact the Young Professionals Association and we can get you some resources um, to help with a resume. But get that resume out to folks and have those interviews. Um, I can, I would say that if you put a nice one together, you're not just going to have one or two interviews uh, before you, you choose your job there. <clears throat> Um, one of the other questions we had, we had Caleb asking, so we're discussing a lot about how to be a good surveyor. What is, what are you finding, Mike, that's, that you might be doing right that's starting to attract and retain these um, young surveyors who are interested in being licensed and, um, you know, you know you can put some work into them? What uh, what are what are you guys doing, or, or what can we be doing as a profession to start to try to attract those folks? Um, hmm. Well, you've got the whole how to attract how to attract somebody who wants to be a land surveyor. There's, there's definitely there's that public outreach that we always talk about, starting maybe at the high school level, um, introducing this profession to the younger generations, um, you get somebody who's been kind of maybe bouncing around from one company to the next, trying to find themselves as a land surveyor. It's maybe showing them uh, the different facets, kind of like was done with me. I came from a, a company that was strong in the residential side of things. We were, I was laying out subdivisions. I was doing title work. Uh, I was doing boundary stakeout, things like that. And I wanted something more. And I found that company that, you know, I mean, never really occurred to me, maybe it should have, that, oh, you know what, the state DOT has survey crews that do survey work. And when they have too much of it, they need to, you know, con contract with the uh, private consultants to handle some of it. The Army Corps, all these all these different agencies have survey divisions. And, and maybe you, you, you make an effort to show, uh, you know, the potential surveyor. Um, or, the, or somebody who thinks they might want to be it, well, this is where this job can take you. Um, you know, you, 
we obviously if we don't want any, we we need the help here in New York, but you want to see Colorado, you know, you want to go see Alaska, go find a job as a land surveyor. You know, you want to you want to get involved in mining. Well, there's surveys involved in mining. Um, show them all the facets, the good and the bad of, of you know, not everything about this profession is fun. But um, as, as far as, you know, helping build somebody into a surveyor, just showing interest. It's always been for me is if somebody shows an interest in me and what I know and what I can provide to them, I turn around and want to give them back plus one. So I feel like if, when somebody comes to me and takes the time to ask me a question, they, they obviously care about what I have to say. And I will try to uh, impart, you know, my experience on them as best as I can. That's great, Mike. I think that's a great point too. Um, but I can tell you one thing not to do on their first day. Don't have them investigating sanitary manholes. Um, there's a reason that's not put on the college brochure for surveying. I can tell you that. Um, opening up those manholes, I've spent many a day in them, and uh, oof, not something I uh, I like to tell people about ahead of time when they're getting into surveying. Um, Jay, did you have a, a comment on that? Yes, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> can they handle it, right? I, I was just going to add that, um, and Caleb, please ch please chime in on the chat if I'm wrong about this, but. I believe you work for the state DEC. I, I, I feel like the municipalities are at a disadvantage to private business, attracting um, apprentice land surveyors and retaining them. And, and, and the reason is because a lot of the salary structures for incoming, uh, you know, whether it's junior civil engineers, Caleb said yes, uh, I, I've seen it. I work closely with Nassau County down on Long Island, and their their once large group of engineers, civil engineers, licensed people, licensed surveyors at the municipal level, has really dwindled over the past ten years. Um, mass retirements, retirement incentives, and and what they've become is this like tiny core group of consultant managers, and. I, I remember asking one of the commissioners who was like, he was, he was exasperated. He was just like, oh my, we don't have enough people to help even manage the work we're handing out to consultants. And I said, I said, well, you know, why can't you hire, hire somebody? And he said, we, he said in the current, this was pre-COVID, but he said they can't compete with the salaries. You know, the, the entry level civil engineering salary that the county was going to pay was 20% less than uh, what, what we were seeing in, in private industry. So, the municipal jobs have their benefits for sure, um, but sometimes the younger uh, graduate is saying, well, I'm gonna grab this bigger salary. And, yeah, I know, great benefits, uh, uh, pension or something like this, but we, we've seen at the local level where these new graduates are gonna chase higher salaries in private business than uh, traditionally lower salaries in the municipal environment. That being said, maybe the state organizations have to make a bit of a marketing push to say, it's beautiful to survey DEC land upstate. If you're someone who's interested in surveying large tracts of land uh, for a state agency where you get great benefits, it's, it's, it's a, it should be a highly attractive position. Um, I don't see them advertised. I, I guess if, if the job posting has to go through like traditional uh, municipal uh, job postings, maybe, maybe they're a little bit hidden. I, I'd say the DEC or uh, the DOT, Mike Lewis said, oh yeah, you don't even realize the DOT has their own survey crews. Yeah, of course they do. But I, I don't see them advertised a lot. So maybe maybe the, the state and the counties have to take a bit of a different approach to how they're advertising the positions and uh, to lure people in. Um, in. In private industry, you know, my company, Part of our website is so that our clients can see what we do. Part of it because we want potential hires to see what we do. And um, I think as a survey, as a surveyor, the fact that my firm has specialized on only geospatial uh, data management is, is a, an attractive quality to some people. They're not just the small survey group in a 150 person plus inter, or a thousand person plus multidisciplinary firm. Uh, where, where land surveyor owned, land surveyor managed, 
And um, that's something we've done our, ourselves to attract people who are interested in land surveying specifically. I hope that answered your, uh, your question a little bit, Caleb. I have a feeling it probably did because I, I know we um, here at National Grid, even being a private company, there's still um, similar challenges, um, you know, with uh, with attracting some talent at uh, at particular rates and whatnot. Uh, definitely, definitely an issue. Um, one of the questions I love is what Phil you provided us, and it's a question we get asked pretty regularly. Um, so Phil does a lot of CAD work. <clears throat> and is trying to figure out how does they, how does how does he familiarize himself with field work in lieu of actually getting out there. Um, first off, the first thing that I would say is when doing CAD, I think one of the best things that you can do is get out into the field to understand how and why things are being shot the way they are. And vice versa. You can get past that. Yep. If you and and vice versa, um, CAD person should know what the field person's doing, and the field person should know what the CAD person is doing. Once you get past those basics of understanding, I struggle with this because I don't know. I, I know there's a lot of folks that say I, I don't have any field experience. I think once you get beyond the understanding of what's happening in the field, me personally, I don't know that you need the field experience. I don't know if you need to know how to cut line to be a land surveyor anymore. I'd be interested to hear both Mike, you and uh, Mike, your your take on it, and Jay. Well, I mean, the first thing to answer Phil's question is, I, I hope I would ask Phil, did you ask your employer, hey, can I go out in the field for two days? And if they say mm -hmm. no, I'd be I'd be polishing your resume. It it makes no sense whatsoever for a CAD person to have no idea how the data is collected. And it makes no sense whatsoever for a party chief to not understand what their work looks like when it's brought into CAD through field to finish. Um, it, it has to be done. It could, it could literally be an afternoon. Oh, that's how you shoot the break line on that retaining wall. That's why it looks so silly. Okay. So as, as, soon as, as soon as that happens, there, there there's becomes a much better relationship between the party chief and the CAD operator. Um, so Phil, you have to ask and um, or demand it or say, what, what do you mean you're not letting me out the field? Like how I need to learn this. It, it should be obvious to a manager that this is this is an important part of the process. I'm not saying every party chief know, needs to know how to do CAD. There's certain people who, man, they've got that CAD brain. They sit there clicking for 10 hours and I can't do it, but other people do it and they love it. They make careers out of it. But your party chief, their day can't be done when they dump the data collector. They have to see what that work looks like in CAD through field to finish so that they understand what the CAD people are seeing based on the work they've done all day. And, and if the CAD operator is having a problem with the way something's being shot, yeah, they have to go out there and understand all the difficulties your field crews face, traffic, weather, et cetera. So, it just it just has to happen. I don't, it, it shouldn't even be a question. It's, it doesn't need to be a six month stint. It could literally be an afternoon. It's it's eye opening. Mike, how about you? No, Jay nailed it. Um, again, you know we I came up as a hybrid. We call them you know the hybrid and surveyor here. I did field. I did office. Um, if you're a CAD operator um, and you want to know what field work is like, go out and find that opportunity, ask, push for it. Um, and it kind of ties into what I said before. If you're, uh, you know, I get it. Employers are so busy that they feel like, oh, I, I really need you crunching cat all day long. But if they can't, if they don't see the value in um, getting you some of that experience that you're asking them for and how it might, you know, then, then have that conversation or um, maybe, I don't, you know, I hate to drive people away from where they are if they're happy, but find a company that, that you know, f can f help f help you fulfill your goals. Uh, that's that's Absolutely. basically it. I, I know, and that and, is right. Go ahead, Jack. I was going to say, 
you know, I, I'm an employer, so it's easy for me to say, like, I know I would tell the person, yeah, we're going to schedule to go in the field for half a day. Let's start there. Back in the day, I volunteered to do title surveys on the weekends with some people who were doing them to get uh, boundary experience. Um, so I, ju I just went to work on a Saturday to learn what the other side of the office was doing. And I, I just took it on as a, a personal uh, improvement thing. And, uh, you know, com company be damned. I'm improving myself as an individual. And uh, it, you know, it, it pays dividends. Um, Mike said it earlier, you got to keep learning. Uh, you can't always expect your employer to drag you through your career. So you have to empower yourself and uh, seize opportunities where available. So that meant me, uh, you know, getting out in the field for a few hours on a Saturday unpaid. It, it was a learning experience. and. Uh, I took it, and that's how I yeah. learned to do better work. And I think that's a great point, Jay. Um, it's it's an unpopular phrase that I like to say, but no one cares about you in business. <laughs> no one cares about you. You're there to do a job. If you're doing your job and you're doing your job fine, people aren't going to stop you from doing your job. But yeah. if you're doing the job that if you're deciding you want to do a better job, it's up to you to make that decision and make those changes to get that better job because no one else is going to push you to do it. Um, unless you work with only two other people in an office and all of a sudden they lose a drafter and they're going to want you to start drafting, that's when they'll push you to, to learn drafting. Um, right. My experience, I started as a rod person of a three-person crew, um, realized that I was going to be stuck there for a while and decided that I was going to learn drafting and bought a Carlson drafting book and figured out how to do it and then found a class and then started drafting. Then all of a sudden when 2008 hit and there was no more room for the field crews, all of a sudden I was one of the few people who was retained to, to draft because now I knew how to draft. Right. So make sure you're building the skill set that you want. Make sure you're building a skill set of things that interest you. Um, in addition to the things that your employer needs, but make sure that there are things that are gonna keep you engaged in your employment, not just what your employer needs at the moment. Um, I think that's huge advice. Uh, I do wanna jump back. I know we just have a few more minutes, but I wanna, I wanna touch on Caleb. Um, Jay, are you seeing that question there? Caleb's looking, so he's also wondering about within the private industry, um, what are you guys doing to attract surveyors? Um, there's telecommuting, flexible hours, um, you know, and flexible hours while not performing field work, healthcare retirement. Is there anything special that you guys are particularly doing to try to reach people out there? Um, I, we, one of, one of our, Tenants, um, especially for the office staff, um, has been flexibility. Uh, Christine gayron has been preaching that for a decade. Um, she's a mom. She's got three kids. Everyone has lives outside of work. So even pre-COVID, if, if you're an office person, um, come in and get your work done. Whether that starts at six or nine, we don't really care as long as you're communicative and consistent. Um, that kind of grew with COVID, you know, it's, we had everyone working at home and it's no, no one's babysitting you, right? We, 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 we've made sure to hire all these people that fit our culture, that are, that are self-motivated people. If, if you get your work done, you get your work done. Um, no, no one is asking you to punch a time clock. Field crews are a big exception to that, but that they never really have a problem having stricter hours because they're all self-motivated to, be in the office by 5.30, 6 o'clock because they want to get to the city before the traffic or uh, they, they need to, you know, beat the traffic out uh, at the Shinnecock Canal. Whatever whatever they're doing, they're, they're, they all fit our mold, so they're all like-minded to say, hey, let's start at the crack of dawn because that's what surveyors do. Um, but, hey, if someone has a dentist appointment or something like it, yeah, it's not a big deal. We just work around it. Um, I'm seeing some of those other things here, flexible hours, telecommuting. Yeah, obviously with COVID, everyone was, everyone was telecommuting. 
And uh, while my offices are both, you know, 90 plus back, if someone says, I need to work from home on Tuesday, we, we don't even blink an eye. Like, that's it. Did I just lose you? No? No, oh, we got you. Sorry. Um, you know, we don't even blink an eye. Just be communicative to your manager. Um, be on team so that your team can, um, you know, work with you throughout the day. You, you miss that interaction when you're home, to, when you know, someone walks by and says, hey, can you take a look at something quick? But if you're on if you're on Teams, guess what? That still happens. You you get to do that, you know, ping somebody on the chat and say, hey, can you look at this with me? I'm going to share my screen for four seconds. Um, I'd say it's private industry, especially small business. The healthcare options, I imagine they're not as good as the municipal options. Um, we're 65 people, but we're still like in that small business grouping. So, uh, you know, Christine and I like to pay a high percentage of everyone's deductibles, but um, you're still shopping for healthcare off the um, uh, you know, the state website pretty much. Uh, our, our retirement package is a, a profit sharing plan at um, three, four percent, depending on uh, how things go. It's not a match. We just give that to you whether you contribute nothing or you contribute 10 percent, whatever it is, you're getting four percent from us. Um, I think the number one attractive thing we do is um, get the right people in our organization. And uh, the right people attract more of the right people and we attract those original people by making sure that they fit our core values and then and then the icing on top of that is let's let's buy the nicest equipment let's get the new trucks let's get the new software um, that stuff is cheap compared to the amount of money we spend in labor so surveyors love toys like, like let's keep buying the toys and the right people know how to use them and uh, that, that's how we attract talent. And frankly, it's how we retain it. Uh, we've had many people leave and I, sometimes we joke and say, okay, see you in six months. And um, most people want to come back. We, 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 we really work hard on the culture and then everything else falls in place. Oh yeah, it's, it's really well said. Go ahead, Mike. I was say, sorry, Tim, to jump in to that point since I'm, you know, I am an employee and a project manager here he hit the nail on the head with the whole culture thing. Um, I worked here, I worked for a surveyor, I left to come work for, you know, th this this company, the legacy companies, uh, the economy couldn't support um, the, the employment here and I got laid off and I went somewhere else and I, you know, I reached that that tipping point in my career and, and a simple email from Christine that I happened to be lumped into where she was, they were having an open house to try and, and, you know, clients and network partners and this and that. And I, I kind of <laughs> pried my way back in, you know, Christine says, all right, what, what are you doing here? I says, I want to come home. I want to come back. I like the culture here. I like the people who work here. You know, you, we work hard, we play hard. You, uh, you don't, you don't mix words. You tell me what's expected of me and I do my best to provide that. Um, and I think that's the separation. And you know, my wife works for the, the municipal. So I see her complaints every single day um about just getting stuck in that cog of uh but we're locked into the golden handcuffs of, of the of the the benefits and the retirement package and this and that um and, and that's that's really uh jay jay nailed it right there but i just wanted to throw that part into it being on the other side there Jay, I think the, if you were able to see the, and first off, thank you all for the questions and the, and the, and the back and forth. It's exactly what we're hoping to have these conversations be. We're hoping that they're all really giving you guys some value. Um, Jay, I feel like this is probably a great question from Darren for, for you to speak to, um, when you're reviewing, uh, employees, um, professions, you know, and their experience. Um, I mean, the, the construction experience is is uh, is huge, Darren. Um, our our office in Rochester does a lot of construction uh, layout, machine control modeling, stuff like that. And these guys have a, a working knowledge of how things are actually built. And um, it's it's there's there's a certain there's a major difference between the title surveyors and then there's the topo surveyors and then there's the construction surveyors. 
and it's it's a it's a nice niche and it's a very important skill set um we like to put the fear of god into our party chiefs when they go put a a stake in the ground where someone's going to pour concrete um it's a very permanent thing you better know what you're doing you better be communicative with the gc because mistakes are really expensive if we catch a mistake on the design side, it's like, okay, the, en the engineer is a little annoyed, but we delete that line and we move it. Um, you pour concrete in the wrong place and uh, you need a jackhammer or an excavator to fix it and things get pricey real fast. Um, so I'm not sure what you're thinking about your career long term, but construction experience is super important. Um, we have LSs in our office who you know, they maintain their licenses, they have enough boundary experience to get their license, but they well, they want to live in that construction world. And that's that's turning designs into 3D models, turning 3D models into uh, actual uh, dozer movement on the ground. We do site control and then we do, you know, traditional, you know, radio layout. Um, I, I, th I think I think the diversity in your background is a major asset. I just the one caveat is if you're looking to be licensed, you can't be uh, writing your RPE, your you know professional experience to get licensed, all about construction layout. Uh, that counts as zero in our licensure. You have to relate all that experience to boundary work, um, whether that's through some creative writing or uh, you know realizing that a lot of what you lay out starts from offsets from a boundary line. So hopefully you get some experience uh, determining those boundary lines, and then that turns into laying out construction in relation to those boundary lines. But I, I, like I said, the construction background is great. Just the caveat that if you want to use that experience for licensure, um, you either have you either need more years uh, with the boundary experience, or you need to be a little bit creative in your RP. That's great advice too, Jay, and I think that's a huge thing when we when we look at our um, experiences, um, really ensuring that as much as it as much as it's a pain, if you have licensure as a career goal, there are certain requirements that the state's going to look for. Um, but Darren, uh, let me tell you, I have uh, I spent quite a bit of time uh, on construction sites uh, and doing a lot of construction surveying, which led me to where I am now at National Grid. I deal while i do deal with a lot of boundary line and a lot of encroachments on them we're the second largest property owner in new york um we we have quite a bit of boundary but the good portion of what i'm doing is uh engineering work and engineering and, and doing all of that so um great great feedback today guys uh ladies as well i apologize i don't mean to be exclusive um, everybody on the line, really appreciate everyone attending today. Um, if you have questions, have comments, uh, please let us know. Uh, there will be a survey that's going to come out after this. It would be great if you all could um, shoot us some, some information on that. And let us know what you're interested in talking about. It was great hearing from you guys, and, and we hope to hear from you guys in uh, two months from now. Heather, I'll, I'll throw it back to you to do a couple closings for us. But thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Yes, thank you everyone um, for joining us and a big thank you to the Young Professionals Committee for their time and dedication to the organization. A short evaluation will be sent um, by email this afternoon, so please take the time to fill it out and provide feedback for the committee. Um, thanks again for attending and I hope you all have a great weekend. Bye. Thanks all. And remember that that feedback is going to help us put on uh, put on other things that are going to benefit all of you. So we hope to hear from all of you. Thanks again.